right, it's eight o'clock here on the Pacific Coast. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to our next installment of TinyML Talks. My name is Ravi Sivalingam from Qualcomm AI Research. I'll be your moderator today. Uh, I'd like to thank our TinyML Talk sponsors, DeepLight, Kixo, Edge Impulse, Reality AI, Maxim Integrated, and Syncense. Additional sponsorships are available both for the global TinyML Talks as well as for the local TinyML Talks. Please contact Betty at tinyml.org for more info. Our upcoming uh, next TinyML Talks uh, are on Tuesday, September 15th. Uh, we have Hiroshi Doyu from Ericsson Research and Vikran Tomar and Sam Meyer from Fluent.ai. Uh, same time, 8 a.m. Pacific, uh, two weeks from now. Please contact talks at tinyml.org if you're interested in presenting at any of the global or local meetups. I, I do have another announcement. Uh, March 22nd to 23rd of 2021, we have the next TinyML Summit. Uh, the call for presentations and posters for the summit are out at tinyml.org. This time around, we have a research symposium on day two of the summit, and the call for papers are uh, out on the website as well. Uh, please visit tinyml.org for more details. Deadlines for submission is uh, November 2nd. Uh, just a reminder uh, to everyone, uh, the talk video will be posted on YouTube and the slides will be posted on our forum page by tomorrow. So uh, you can, you can uh, view that as soon as it's out, you'll get a notification. And if you have any questions, please do ask them in the Q&A box and not in the chat box, because uh, I'll be observing the Q&A box and asking questions throughout the talk. Uh, our next speaker today is Christopher Carlson from Brainchip Inc. He's gonna present on the Akira Neural Processor, Low Power CNN, Inference, and Learning at the Edge. Christopher Carlson is a senior research scientist at Brainchip Inc. Previously, he was a postdoc at UC Irvine, where he studied unsupervised learning rules in spiking neural networks and neuromorphic computing. Afterwards, he worked as a postdoc at Sandia National Labs, where he applied uncertainty quantification to computational neural models and developed neuromorphic systems. In his current role, he's involved in the design and optimization of ML algorithms and hardware architecture of Brainchip's latest SOC, Akida. Take it away, Chris. All right, uh, thanks for that introduction, Ravi. And also uh, thanks to the uh, TinyML organizers for uh, allowing me to give a talk about this. So as you mentioned, I'm, I'm gonna be talking about the Akita Neural Processor, which offers a low power CNN inference and learning at the edge. All right, so let's talk about our Akita Neural System on a Chip or the Akita NSOC. So uh, we built an NSOC uh, that performs CNN inference and learning at the edge by util utilizing neuromorphic design principles. So here's a, a list of the important uh, neuromorphic design principles that we used, uh, kind of close to order of importance. So first and foremost, we perform event-based versions of conventional machine learning algorithms to take advantage of activation sparsity. So let's take a, take a step back about and explain what that means. So activation sparsity, that's just the percentage of uh, non-zero activations uh, in, in, in your computation. And so uh, we also, de we define an event as a non-zero. So your, your percentage of, uh, sorry, uh, activation sparsity is your percentage of zero activations. A an event is a non-zero activation, all right? So the, the, whole, the whole point here is the Akita only processes non-zero activations. Okay, so if you have high activation sparsity, um, that means you would have a, a small number of events and therefore you won't have to do that much computation. And so we built our entire hardware uh, system to be able to process this, uh, just be event-based, okay? All right, uh, second, we utilize a low bit precision computation with both weights, AKA parameters and activations. So we do one, two and four bits. Uh, four bit is as high as we go. And, uh, and I'll talk a little bit about why that is and what you get for that. Um, here. I should also mention uh, that we co-locate memory and processing. So we do this by distributing computation across many smaller cores. We call them neural processing units, NPUs. Uh, and so they work in parallel. Instead of 
kind of just putting all the computation in one big systolic array, like many deep learning accelerators or DLAs. So uh, because of that, each of these NPUs has its own memory and computational processing elements. And so you don't have to move information around. Uh, I think uh, uh, Surin had a good little uh, graph about how, uh, what it costs, or he had a, a table about what it costs to move, ener uh, energetically speaking, what it costs to move stuff around like data and uh, it costs a lot, so you don't want to do that. Um, finally, we run at lower clock speeds to keep overall power consumption low. Um, and you can, because of that, you can do some cool tricks. You can use like uh, low leakage memory and things like this. Uh, and the last, the last point is something that, that's also very important. So we implement a proprietary on-chip unsupervised learning algorithm. And this is so, I'll actually, I'll talk a little bit about why, why we do this, but it's really so we can do training at the edge. All right, so, so in my talk, I'm going to just talk about these three points, the event-based thing, the uh, utilizing of low-bit precision computation for both weights and activations, and our on-chip unsupervised learning algorithm. So that's, those are the three things I'll be talking about. So for each one of these things, let's, let's see what we get from, from, from using these things. So when we perform event-based versions of conventional machine learning algorithms, um, what we're really doing is getting a 40 to 60% base reduction in the, in the number of max required per inference, okay? When you compare it to a non-event-based hardware solution. All right, and, I'll, and, I'll, and uh, in my next few slides, I'll just kind of describe why, why, why we're doing that or rather how we're doing that. Um, but remember that's, so that's about a 50% reduction in computational cost out of the box. So that's very important. Second, so when we, when we utilize a little bit of precision, if you compare us to like an eight bit machine learning accelerator, you'll get a 50% reduction in uh, required memory and bandwidth, right? So if you go down to four bit and most things are eight bit, then you're just gonna, that's about, you're gonna save half, half uh, the space. Now, of course, you can, there are situations where you can go one bit or two bit, and you can go even lower, and, that, and that's, that's good too. We support that. And finally, we, uh, I mentioned that we have this on-chip unsupervised learning algorithm. We do this so we, we can retrain at the edge instead of retraining in the cloud, okay? And again, this is, uh, I can uh, go back to, to Surin's uh, talk, that the cost of phoning home, so to speak, is high. So you really want to avoid that. So we build something to uh, avoid that and keep this low power. So this whole thing is supposed to be a very low power uh, inference chip with edge learning. All right, so before I, I go into those, those three points, let me, I just wanna quickly mention this, the Akita Software Development Environment, ADE, and, uh, and how you would use it. So we, we built this, our whole Akita Software Development stack is really kind of very similar to TensorFlow and TensorFlow Keras. It's built off that, so if you're familiar with those, uh, deep learning frameworks, then using our framework will be really intuitive for you. So it's just like other Python packages, you just use pip install. And then the other thing I want to mention is that when we're, when we're uh, what your normal workflow would be, uh, you, you would take your original neural network model, you would use our uh, TF Keras API, that our, our, our custom one, to make sure it was kind of compatible with our chip using our compatible layers. And then you would do this quantization aware training, right? So that means if you start at 32 bit, you, you would have to retrain using quantization aware training to, to, to keep the accuracy as you go down, uh, go down in bit width. And again, we're talking about activations and uh, parameters, weight, weight parameters that you can go down in. And finally, you save the network and it automatically gets converted into something. And so you can read a lot more about this in our, in our documentation. All right, so let's get, let's get back to these three points that I was talking about. So I'm gonna talk about event-based, low bit precision, and this on-chip learning algorithm. So let's go to the event-based computation stuff first. Okay, so the key aspects of event-based process. So, when we, so we implement event-based versions of convolutions and dot products uh, from the ground up to minimize overhead. So the, the, the key point here is we don't have to kind of do this thing where you search for zeros and activations and try to find something no, we're completely event-based. So each one of these neural processing units just communicates with one another using only events, okay? So by, by default, we're not searching through activations looking for zero, non-zero ones. Um, second thing I wanna mention is that 
there's, there's, when you go from uh, non-event-based to event-based, there's no loss in accuracy, okay? So the algorithm is different, but the core calculations are identical. All right, so that's important to understand. So, so if we're talking about quantization, yes, you can, we can talk about stuff you might lose, accuracy you might lose, but not in event-based, from non-event-based to event-based. Finally, I just want to repeat the fact that higher activation sparsity, that, that, that means, you know, more zeros in activations. So that's, that's fewer events and fewer operations. So when I say high activation sparsity, I'm talking about doing less computation. Okay. All right. So uh, a little bit about how we do this. So when you use batch normalization, uh, batch normalization gives us a 40 to 60% activation sparsity as a starting point. Okay. And that's because on average, rectified linear units or ReLUs, they're centered around zero. And so kind of roughly half, half their outputs are zero, right? Because you're, if you're centered at zero, to the right will be non-zero, to the left will be zero. So because batch normalization is so useful and many people use it in their, in, in their neural networks, uh, we, we use this to just get our base level of activation sparsity. And so uh, that's, that's how we do it. And it's nice because that's just a common important uh, neural, uh, computa uh, convolutional neural network training technique that we use. Uh, okay, so finally, uh, we, we can also further increase activation sparsity by using something called activity regularization during training. So activity regularization is just the process of adding more information uh, to the loss function to balance the model's accuracy and activity sparsity. All right, so here, this is a really interesting trade-off that, that uh, pretty much if, if you're not event-based, it doesn't make sense for you to try to do. And, but we are event-based, so we, we can play with this. And so you can have a trade-off between how much power you want to spend and, and maybe losing a really small amount of accuracy and, and, and doing this trade-off between these two things. So this, what's really cool is this is already built in to TensorFlow. So we just, we just utilize this when we, when we do it. Okay, so let me, let me show you some, uh, some results from some of our uh, 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 examples. So uh, this is talking about how Akita utilizes activation sparsity to reduce a computation. And so on, on this uh, y-axis, we're talking about the effective max per inference. And I'm, I'm in uh, mega max or millions per max. And what I'm, what I'm looking at is I'm comparing non-event domain 8-bit DLAs versus Akita, which is event-based. And I'm looking at uh, three so I'm, I'm running MobileNet on three different image sets, or uh, uh, three different data sets. So MobileNet v1 on ImageNet, which is 1,000 classes. MobileNet v1 on ImageNet, which is 20 classes. And MobileNet v1 on Visual WaveWork, which is just two classes, OK? And so is, is the, again, that's the non-event domain. And so you're, no matter what, you're going to do 569 million max per inference, OK? But when you, when you use an event-based approach, you're really only going to use 55%. You only need to do 55% of that computation uh, in the, uh, for the ImageNet case. Or for the ImageNet case, it's uh, 54%. Or for visual wake where it's 52%. So I want to show you this just because when you first start out, they're actually all quite similar. Like we get, because like I said, on average, it'll be 40 to 60%. So it makes sense that they're all kind of centered around this thing. Now, what's, what's more interesting is when you try to use uh, activity regularization, so this is the thing where we're going to put it in our loss function and try to penalize the network for, for using too many events, right? So let's see what happens when we do that. So this is the same graph. So blue is still uh, non-event based. Uh, light, sorry, uh, dark blue is not event based. Light blue is event based. And uh, in gray is event based uh, plus activity regularization. So if you look at MobileNet on ImageNet, which is a thousand classes, right? This is a harder problem than these other two. When, when you try to do this uh, uh, activity regularization, you really don't get much. You really don't get much bang for your buck here, okay? And so when we first, when we were playing with this, we thought, oh, that's too bad. I wish we really could do better. But then we realized, let's, let's take a look at, at some of these data sets that are a little less challenging and actually a little bit more practical for edge computation, right? Because I don't, uh, many edge applications, you're not going to have a thousand classes. You're going to have something from, you know, 20 to 30 to, you know, two, so, so somewhere in this range, two to 20. So for these cases, 
um, we can actually get a, a, another 50% reduction. So at the end of the day, you're doing only 24% of the original max that you had to do, okay? And, and you lose very little accuracy. And the best part about this is this is a tunable thing. You, you, this is a trade-off you could take as a user. You could say, I'm willing to lose 5% or I'm losing, only willing to lose you know, 0.2%. So, so uh, you know, I'm, go, I'm only going to lose this, um, this, this much accuracy to get this much power, uh, this much power of savings. So anyway, uh, I just wanted to point that out. So for these more practical use cases, stuff that, that's, that's more practical for, for edge learning, uh, we get really nice reduction in uh, the amount of computation you need to do. So we're doing about a quarter of the amount of stuff you need to do. All right. So now let's talk about this, this idea of low-bit precision with parameters, aka weights and activations. So as I mentioned before, I key to use one to four bits for activations and parameters. So this is really just a 50% or greater uh, reduction in memory and memory bandwidth uh, when compared to 8-bit hardware. And again, I say or greater because you could go down to 2-bit or 1-bit and you'd, you'd save a bit more. So, so that's what this, this graph here is, is showing. The y-axis is the amount of parameter memory that you're using in megabytes. And again, we're talking about mobile net run down these different image, uh, th these, da these different data sets. And so the reason they're different sizes is because at, at the classification layer accounts for a lot of the size. So, so uh, mobile net V1 on image net, it's four megabytes or just two megabytes if you go down to four bit. So that everything is, of course, if you compare it to eight bit, it's just half of it. So three goes down to one and a half in, in both these cases. Okay, so I also want to mention that we, we currently perform quantization aware training to preserve accuracy, as I, as I mentioned previously. Um, but I, also, uh, I, I think it's worth mentioning that although we do that right now, there's a ton of research showing uh, that you can preserve accuracy with, with post-training 4-bit quantization, so without kind of needing to retrain, okay? And so right now, the past few years, there's been just an, an explosion in research. This is just one citation, Banner, uh, uh, in uh, advances in neural information processing systems. So, so the timing is very good. If, you, if you're just using 4-bit, the timing is very good. And, and we've actually just started to, to, to play with this. And, and, to, and there's, a, there's a few uh, data sets where we can actually implement this and not require uh, quantization-aware training, but something where you just do this post-training in 4-bit. All right, and so let me just quickly uh, mention our, some selected quantization results. So here's a table, it's got, in this column we have different models with the number of parameters. In this column we have the data sets. In this column we have the number of classes in that data set. Here we have the, the weight activation and quantization, so four bit weights, four bit activations. And then here's the quantized accuracy versus the 32 bit float accuracy. So if we start with smaller networks, you see uh, uh, 24K parameters, we're running on Google speech commands. Again, I lost 0.3% accuracy from going from 32-bit to 4-bit to four bit in weights and activations. And if you keep going down, what you'll see here is even when I get up to mobile net SSD, okay, which is not small, 5.8 million parameters, we lose less than 2% when we go down to 4-bit quantization, okay? And so that's important to point out. So, so the, t the time to be at four bits is pretty much now. You can actually pretty much keep all the accuracy you want, as much as you want, and stay at four bits. So uh, that's very good timing. Uh, one other thing I want to mention is you could, here's an example of us going even lower. If you use VGG, which kind of an older network, it's 14 million parameters. But if you go down to two bit, so now we lose, instead of 2%, we lose 2.5%. Um, so you can really preserve a lot of information when, when you do this. So now I, uh, we can maybe pause for questions, uh, Robbie, if you want to. Yep, thank you. Uh, there are quite a few questions. Let me ask a couple and then we can leave the rest for the end. Uh, would low bit weights affect activation sparsity? Uh, good, that's, that's actually a pretty good question. So intuitively you would think well, wait. There's only a few. There's well, there's only a few states, and you know maybe uh, maybe it's you know this kind of affects things. Well, it's still centered on this quantized value, this uh, uh, this this rectified linear unit. So for the most part, it 
it, it, it could a little bit, but not as much as one would think. So it, it, yes, but only weekly. Is that, at least that's what we've, we've, we've observed. Okay. Uh, how does Akira handle mixed precision operands like uh, one to four bits in parameters and activations? And does yeah. it perform the quantization per channel of a layer? Yeah, so, so it's per, so great. That's a really good question. So it's quantization per layer and, and it can handle, uh, you know, mixed, mixed precision with no problem. So you can have a layer, you know, layer one with two bits and uh, two bit activations and uh, four bit weights. And then it could send information to a layer that's one bit activations, one bit weights, et cetera. So, so it, does it, it doesn't do it per channel, it does it per layer, but it can handle it across those. Okay, thank you. We can continue the rest of the question. All right, it's great. All right, so now, now let's talk about this, this third point, which is, which is ed edge mode. All right, so, um, so here's, here's how we do edge learning. So uh, if you're familiar, for, for those watching, for, if you're familiar with uh, the machine learning uh, technique of uh, transfer learning, it's, it's actually very similar to that. So the idea is you train a CNN feature extractor offline. So that's what this part, this purple network is, uh, on, on the original data set. So something big and helpful like ImageNet. And then you replace the last layer with, with an Akita layer capable of on-chip learning. And then the way our on-chip learning algorithm works is it, it does few-shot learning really, really well. So you perform few-shot learning. You first retrain the original classes that you cared about. Okay, so let's say there's a subset of ImageNet. You train on ImageNet, there's a subset of those classes that you want, so you retrain with ours, but you really just present a few, a few you just do a few presentations of these classes. And then you save some room for these new classes. And these new classes, the, the rule of thumb is you're only, you're only as good as your uh, in, uh, feature vector. So if you train an entire network on cars only, and you try to, use it to classify dogs and people, it's probably not gonna work, right? So what you should do is train on something really broad that, has a, that gives you a lot of really nice feature vectors that are uh, uh, a really rich feature vector coming out, okay? So, so uh, what I'm saying is these new classes should share similar features with original classes, okay? Uh, but remember, they don't have to be classes from the original training thing. So, uh, we've demonstrated edge learning for object detection using mobile net trained on image net data set, which, which I'll talk about later. Uh, we've done it for keyword spotting on the Google speech commands data set. And we've also done it for uh, hand gesture classification um, on a custom dynamic vision sensor events data set. And, and actually that's, that's part of what Surin was, was talking about, these dynamic vision sensors. Uh, they, they produce events uh, very quickly. They have a really uh, uh, um, really fast uh, 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 computation, so they can pretty much just give you events really, really quickly. Okay, and so we can we can process those events directly. So we can talk a little bit maybe about that later. All right. So let's let's talk about actually just talking about uh, edge learning with MobileNet and ImageNet. So now we're gonna we're talking about uh, let we're gonna do a demo here, and so we have MobileNet V1. And uh, we're gonna run this on the Akita simulator. It's got 30 layers, 569 million max, uh, 4.2 million parameters. And remember, because they're four bit, it's only two megabytes of parameter memory. And we ran this on our Akita chip simulator. And to the right, this is how this network was distributed across our, our NPUs, our neural processor units. So you can see that layer one, uh, three, N three NPs were able to, 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 to compute that. Uh, la layer two, it was handled by four NPs, et cetera. So, so this is how we distribute layers across our chip, okay, across these little computational elements or neural processing units. So now I'm gonna show you this, this uh, on-chip learning demo. Um, so this was uh, pre-trained on ImageNet. We replaced the last layer with the Akita learning layer, and then we did one-shot learning. And I just wanna repeat that the new classes do not need to be part of the original data set. All right, so let's take a quick look at this. All right. So again, we trained on ImageNet originally using backprop offline, and then we replaced the last layer with the Akita fully connected layer. 
So now we're going to do one shot learning um, to learn new classes using one sample each. So first we'll, we'll train just, I'll show you, let's see. So first we're going to do just the background. So we trained, here's the background image. Uh, we, we type the name of the, the label, then we click learn new class. And then this is what the network thinks it's looking at. So it says, okay, now I'm looking at the background. So we train the background. Now we train a tiger, train an elephant. Okay, that's the only image. And again, these are just these little toys. We train a moose, which isn't in the original ImageNet data set, by the way, that we used. Uh, we train a panda, and then a police car, and then I think a cop. All right, so that's that's all it has. Now it's now this thing is retrained, just one shot, one shot learning. Okay, so now let's just see how robust these are at different angles. Okay, and of course this is the power of using convolutional neural networks. It's an invariant feature vector that that's produced, and we're just learning what that feature vector is. So we're using the power of convolutional neural networks to be able to do this. So you can see it. At every angle, it still looks like an elephant to the network. Here's the moose. Looks pretty well. Okay, so the police car, it does pretty well, but you're gonna see from the front, it actually thinks it's a cop. Let's go back there, yes. So from the front, it actually gets a little confused and thinks it's a cop. So what we can do in this instance, is say, okay, let's, let's add another, we don't have to do one shot learning. Let's just give, let's let the user just put something in front and say, no, from this angle, this is still, this is still a police car. So we add an extra one, police car. All right, so that's a second shot. And now it's robust. Say, so, okay, I should be able to handle it at every angle. All right, so this is just something that's, that's an interesting aside that shows how effective this is. So we use one shot learning to train these toys, training on these, these toys. Um, but now let's test the network using pictures of real tigers and real elephants, okay? So that means it should be able to say, okay, I learned off this toy, so this is also a picture of an elephant. So. There we go. So this is the power of using, you know, a really well-trained uh, neural network on, on, on ImageNet is it produces these feature vectors that you can use. All right, so it's, it's very effective. So let me just get to our chip. So the AKD1000, this is our NSOC AI edge solution. It's a single platform for CNN inference with on-chip learning, okay? And so just very, very briefly, let's see, yeah, I've got a little time. Uh, here is the, the actual neuron fabric. So it has, it implements 80 NPUs, 80 neural processing units. Remember, they each have their own memory and, and computational elements. Uh, it's all digital. Um, you can license it as an IP core, and it's in, our first implementation is in uh, DSMC at 28 nanometers, okay? So I also want to mention that we have this M-class CPU, uh, it's, and we use it for system management and Akita configuration. So really, the, the host really doesn't have to do anything. It's just all managed on this NSOC, okay? We also have external memory interfaces, like here, and multi-chip expansion, um, and a list of uh, data input interfaces here. But I, I also want to point out that we have this conversion complex. And this is really about the, what the input to the network is like. So we have a, a dedicated pixel to, to spike. Spike is also an event. So a pixel to event converter. And what that does is take an image and encodes it in events. We have a proprietary algorithm to do this uh, very efficiently. And so that's one way to get information. And you just put images in and they're automatically converted. You could also use our software data to spike encoder, which uses, you can take any multivariable digital data and sound pressure, temperature, and just encode it. Uh, I should mention that 
again, uh, Surin mentioned uh, being interested in, in a DBS sensor in, his, in, his, in, the, in the previous talk, and that's something that we can process directly. We just, uh, events come in, they're formatted in the way that they're then uh, slightly modified to be formatted in the way that Akita reads them and then process directly. So we can process those things really efficiently. All right, so coming to the summary. So to compare to 8-bit non-event-based hardware, uh, Akita runs CNN inference with 50% uh, or greater reduction in required memory and bandwidth. Okay, or a full, and sorry, a 40 to 75% reduction in max when we use the event-based design with activity regularization. So we have more than just a few networks that got up to 75% reduction in, in the amount of computation you needed. Uh, so also uh, our runtime software manages all the configuration and network loading. As I mentioned before, the application level API is really similar to TensorFlow Care. People should be able to pick this up pretty easily if you're already familiar with machine learning uh, popular machine learning frameworks. Um, we have our incremental on-chip learning that we can, learning only requires a few samples and that's from the demo that I showed. And then finally, uh, we're available, the, uh, it's available as a chip or embedded IP in your SOC. Uh, the chip is currently, we, we fabbed it, it's currently being tested in Aliso Viejo, California. So that's where we are with that. And uh, I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you, Chris. Uh, we mm -hmm. have a bunch of questions. So let's see how much we can get through in two sure. minutes, and then we can continue on the forum. Uh, how many new classes can you extend the original set? Is there a limitation? Yeah. So, so there there is some sort of uh, there is some upper limit in terms of like memory, <laughs> uh, but but usually what that's not going to be your limiting factor. Your limiting factor is going to be um, in it's going to be in how many classes that you that you add. Uh, and how it's going to be related to how good your uh, initial training is. So for instance, if you train on image that you can maybe add, you know, let's say 10 classes, may maybe 20 classes, but there's going to be some limit there where some of the classes are going to get too similar to one another, right? Because backpropagation is, is, can, is able to separate those and we're not doing backpropagation. So we're, we're really just using the existing invariant feature vector that's coming out of a backprop train network. So what I'm saying is it depends on your data set and the difficulty of it. For many practical edge learning applications, uh, you know, people use from you know two to twenty, that is the range that we're targeting adding new classes for. So that's that's what it's designed for. So you could probably go if it's easier, you could do more. If it's it's harder, maybe you would do a little less. Got it. So, so really about uh, how the backbone, uh, the feature space, uh, how the things are separated. Absolutely, absolutely. And if, of course, if you know more about your data, you can train a more effective version of that and then be able to add more classes. Got it, got it. Uh, are all common CNN layer types supported on the Akita chip? Yeah, so, so we, uh, if you go to our documentation, I'm glad they asked, asked that because if you look at our, you can see what's supported on our documentation. Mm -hmm. But very briefly, we support uh, feed forward, uh, CNNs um, that so so this so, is so mostly uh, convolutional layers. Uh, we also do uh, depth-wise separable convolutional mm -hmm. layers and fully connected or affine or dense, however you want to call it. So those are the so pretty much most of the common ones we, we support those. Okay, uh, there's a couple of questions about uh, tops per watt or energy per inference or overall power consumption of the chip. Sure, sure. So. Uh, Tops per watt is always a, an interesting question because uh, with a lot of a lot of times that that allows people to only measure the tops per watt of their uh, accelerator and not the tops per watt of the system as a whole. And so we found that that's a, sometimes a little bit misleading. So we, we, when we do get, uh, show uh, people an estimation of tops per watt, it's always for the whole system. I don't have tops per watt numbers right right now for this thing. Part of the reason is because we're, we're we've been getting uh, we we've been doing power estimations and now we actually have the chip so we actually want to do these physical measurements now so that's why we haven't in the past we've talked a little bit more about power but now that we have the chip we're going to do these measurements later on so that's why I don't have uh, power numbers here because we're still working on getting physical power numbers. Got it. Uh, there are a couple of questions about how the neural network layers are split between the different NPUs. Yeah, yeah, great. So I can talk a little bit more, more, more about that. So the idea is that uh, 
you, you, you take, uh, each NPU has a certain amount of memory that can hold uh, input events and uh, filter, filter information or weight parameters. So pretty much you can split, if, 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 if an MPU can't hold as many inputs as, as it needs to be able to, you can split those inputs. So one MPU looks at half of the inputs and another MPU looks at another half of the inputs. And so the, the cool thing is we're, we, have, we have a, a compiler allocator uh, thing, that software tool that automatically does this stuff. Okay, so the user doesn't need to worry about how this stuff gets distributed. It's automatically distributed for us. And, and another cool aspect of this is because of, uh, you know, we, we have these little, we have these little cores, we have a more granular way to cut up computation. So if you, if you already fit the, the model on and you have these extra NPUs, you can put the NPUs where they're needed most to further accelerate things in a more efficient way. So you, if you have 20 NPUs left over, you can put uh, MPUs on the, on the layer that's the most expensive and reduce your time. So you're pretty much doing this like, you could do almost like a load balancing when you first start. Got it, got it. Uh, there are actually uh, a bunch of more questions. Unfortunately, for the lack of time, we'll have to move them to the forums. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much, Chris. Yeah, sure. Yep, let me request control and we can go. Uh, we'd like to thank our uh, Dynamical Talk sponsors, uh, DeepLight, Keekso, Edge Impulse, Reality AI, Maxim Integrated, and Sinsen. Additional sponsorships are available. As mentioned, please contact Betty at tinyml.org. DeepLight. DeepLight uses AI to make other AI faster, smaller, and more power efficient. Edge Impulse. Edge Impulse en enables developers to create the next generation of intelligent device solutions with embedded machine learning. Get your free account at edgeimpulse.com. Uh, Maxim Integrated, enabling edge intelligence with sensors, signal conditioning, low power Cortex M4 micros, and advanced AI acceleration. I believe. Kixo AutoML for embedded AI, automated machine learning platform that builds tiny ML solutions for the edge using sensor data. Reality AI, engineering solutions for the edge, next generation AI tools for product development. Sinsense builds ultra low power sensing and inference hardware for embedded mobile and edge devices. All right, thank you to our sponsors again. And uh, just a reminder for the next TinyML Talks that's coming up on September 15th. And also please check out tinyml.org for the 2021 TinyML Summit information. Thank you everyone.